And that's what this occasion is all about. The stars, the entrepreneurs, the inventors, the writers, the journalists, the engineers, even the kids like myself who rode bicycles out to the country before dawn to turn on the transmitter. Eventually, it's about the medium of broadcasting itself, the medium that comes to you out of thin air to move the world. Allow me to introduce your master of ceremonies for the afternoon, a gentleman whose accomplishments in the medium placed him on our stage as a giant in the class of 2008. It's my honor to present Bill Baker. It's so nice to be here, and I love volunteering for this assignment. I love to honor uh, the great heroes and heroines of our industry. First up was Norman Lear, as much a philosopher as a writer, as much a prophet as a producer. Of course, he gave us Archie Bunker and Maud, the Jeffersons, Sanford and Son, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, and much more. We were often accused of editorializing in our shows. The expression I'd hear a lot was, say, if you want to send a message, there's Western Union. I had one simple answer for that. You could call what we did editorializing if you want, but it didn't start with our shows. A question that's come up often in dealing with thoughtful entertainment has been, has any of it changed anything? Bigotry and racial attitudes, for example. My answer to that has always been if 2,500 years of Judeo-Christian ethic hasn't rid us of all that, what kind of fool would I be to think our little half-hour TV shows could do it? Honoring the past as well as the present, the library brought Dinah Shore into the ranks of the Giants with a talent undimmed by time, entertainer, talk show host, the wonderful ray of sunshine Frank Sinatra once declared her to be. Her longtime producer, Dick Arlette, accepted the award for his dear friend. I got daisies, daisies, and green pastures. I got my man who could ask for anything more. See the USA in your Chevrolet. America is asking you to call. Drive your Chevrolet through the USA. America's the greatest land of all. Dinah was a perfectionist, capital P. She selected her material meticulously, whether it was a song or it was a new recipe for soup. And with the help of great writers and, and great talent that she always kept uh, at her side, um, managed to go on for all those years and as successfully as she did. Radio occupied a special place in the roster of 2012 Giants as exemplified by Erica Farber, who broke the glass ceiling as the first woman to be named general manager of a major market station, moving on to Interrep, Radio and Records, and is now president of the Radio Advertising Bureau. She spoke for all her gender. Having worked in practically every job in radio, with the exception of hosting a daily show, I've moved across the country, I've been hired, I've been fired, I have gone through consolidation, downsizing, right-sizing, selling a company, but continuing to reinvent. Um, and along the way, helping to fill in some of the potholes that many women face in our business. I thank you for reminding me to reflect on the amazing years I've had the privilege of contributing to what I believe is the most dynamic medium there is, and that's radio. Journalism of the highest integrity was embodied by honorees Robert McNeil and Jim Lehrer. The twin backbone of public television's news efforts and the originators of the first evening news hour. I have been present for every major news event the last 40 years. Present, not involved, but present. In one way or another, I don't mean, I haven't been in Iran when they were, but I've been present, my mind has been present. My, my journalism skills have been present in a way that, I mean, it is the most wonderful, glorious way to, uh, to live a life, and I'm still doing it. When we expanded from 30 minutes to the news hour, some wit said, it already feels like an hour. 
but other people didn't feel that way. They liked the civil tone of the program, the slower pace, the relief from nine second sound bites, which have often degenerated to four second or two and a half second sound bites these days, field reports extending to nine or 10 minutes, the lack of commercial interruption, the absence of the increasingly fashionable tabloid hype on stories like O.J. Simpson, and collectively those people created an audience that has made the program an anchor, so to speak, for the PBS primetime schedule. The unique and entertaining story of Soul Train's groundbreaking history as a cultural landmark was told by Tony Cornelius, son of giant honoree Don Cornelius, who died tragically in early 2012. In accepting the Giants Award, Tony provided insight into the soul of Don Cornelius. And as always in parting, we wish you love, peace, and so. As the Library of Broadcasting has deemed itself keeper of the flame, I too have deemed myself keeper of the flame as it relates to Don Cornelius, his message, as well as his legacy. There were three things that he constantly talked to me about. One in particular is that uh, it's the fine points that count. It was extremely important to him. Uh, secondly, um, I asked for a raise one day, and he said to me, uh, do good work and the money will come. And then lastly, uh, find a need and serve it. He was extremely uh, passionate about finding a need and serving it. Andy Rooney's passage occurred just a month after signing off at the end of a 60-year broadcasting career, most notably having the last word each week on 60 Minutes. They included some of his final observations, followed by a tribute from his colleague of many years and close friend, herself a giant honoree, Leslie Stoll. When I was in high school, I had an English teacher who told me I was a good writer, so I set out to become a writer myself. I've made my living as a writer for 70 years now, been pretty good. People have often told me I said the things they are thinking themselves. I probably haven't said anything here that you didn't already know or have already thought. That's what a writer does. I know I've been terribly wrong sometimes, but I think I've been right more often than I've been wrong. And all this time, I've been paid to say what is on my mind on television. You don't get any luckier in life than that. Andy Rooney was our poet laureate and curmudgeon in chief. He was the most popular and the bravest of us all on 60 Minutes. In our age of so many contradictions with everyone needing to be loved, Andy didn't sugarcoat. He was who he was and that was that, a truth teller who didn't hold back. He was against paying for half empty cereal boxes and he was in favor of newspapers. He was against war, hypocrites and lies. He was for the New York Giants, dogs, ice cream, and the truth. With all his sophistication, Andy Rooney was an everyman, if every man could write like a dream. George Beasley's Horatio Algeresque radio career, his establishment of a cutting edge 50 year old broadcast group, while in the process of forging an unrivaled reputation for integrity, straight shooting, community service, and financial sagacity, led to this acceptance and vote of confidence in radio's importance and lasting viability. Sometimes I guess we look at radio as a uh, medium that is mature, and it is. However, I can't help but believe that radio has many, many more good years left as long as we give our listeners good content, as long as we maintain close ties with our local communities, and as long as we continue to embrace new technology. I think radio will be around for, for quite a long time. The top of the executive line at Broadcasting News, Networking, and High Technology was represented by Sir Howard Stringer, the Welsh immigrant who booked passage by ship with $100 in his pocket to make his fortune in the U.S., eventually serving as head of both 
CBS News and president of CBS Incorporated. He then became the first American to lead Sony Worldwide, of which he is now chairman of the board. Today, of course, we have many news channels and some critics would suggest that there's too much sound and fury and not enough perspective. You can get your news everywhere and you could be very well informed across a variety of spectra. The network news bureaus are mostly gone, but the broadcast and cable channels aided and abetted by tremendous technological advances, including the advent of social media, allow the collection and dissemination of an unprecedented amount of news. I have a 19-year-old who's expert on politics and I've never seen him read a newspaper or watch an evening news program. The anchor leg of the giant ceremony was taken by Ted Turner, who parlayed a billboard and broadcast career into a cable superstation and the first 24-hour news service, CNN. His equally dramatic, daring do included winning the America's Cup and buying MGM while bringing back the endangered buffalo and donating a billion dollars to humanitarian efforts of the United Nations. And now, he's ours. Right before the first Gulf War, I was in L.A. I was dating Jane, and I was at her house, and she was, I was by myself. I took a nap. When I woke up, I thought, because I knew the war was coming, and I knew we had our people there, and I didn't know exactly what the rest was going on, but I turned on the television and clicked it over to uh, NBC, and there was Tom Brokaw talking. And I switched it over to CBS, and there was Dan Rather talking, sitting in the studio. And I switched it over to ABC, and there was Peter Jennings talking in the studio. Then I flashed it over to CNN, and there was the war. <laughs> I love broadcasting, and it, was, uh, it just broke my heart to get squeezed out, pushed out. But that's the way it goes. You know, I, thank God they can't squeeze me out of the United Nations. There's no place to go from there <laughs> except the outer space. I can go out there and jump out of an airplane with that guy that jumped out the other day. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. God bless you all, and thank you very much. <laughs>